Um, OK, so I was going to start. Here, I'll just do this while I'm talking. Uh, I was going to let you look at. Is this going to work? Yes. I was going to let you look at these slides while I told you about what was going on. So these are ads that the government put out during World War I to encourage families to buy bonds, savings bonds, to help to support the war. Um, so this is all I'm going to do on World War I because I've gotten squeezed with time. What we're going to do today is I'm going to start with my article on uh, credit markets, uh, 1920s credit markets, and differences between black and white families and the use of credit. And then look at the, a lot of data, which is in the big thick handout from today, um, describing the Great Depression. So I'm going to do both the 20s that lead into the Great Depression and the Great Depression. So we'll look at the data. So um, a lot of these things you can see when you come to my office, they're on the wall in my office. These are all from postcards I bought at the National Archives. And to finance World War I, it was quite different because World War I, which uh, starts in 1917 for the U.S. involvement, comes after the establishment of the Federal Reserve System. With the establishment of the Federal Reserve System, it's no longer possible for the government to print money to, to pay for its debts. So that's eliminated by the, Federal Reserve, uh, by the Federal Reserve Act. And so what the government has to do to pay for the war is they either have to increase taxes, which indeed they do, uh, or they have to borrow. And so they, they get to, remember how I talked about the, the influx of psychology into advertising in the early teens? So they get these same people who come and advise the government on ways to construct an advertising campaign during World War I to encourage families to lend money to the United States government. There were a whole bunch of programs. Uh, one program was aimed at school kids, and you would buy school saving stamps. So you would take 25 cents in and you would get a stamp that you would lick and put into a booklet. And when you had $5 worth of stamps, then you could take that booklet of stamps and convert it into a bond. And so you would, as a school child, you would lend $5 at a time to the United States government. Um, there's one of these ads talks about war saving stamps. So that's a similar thing, right? Instead of having to buy a whole $5 bond at once, which was quite a stretch for some people, that you could buy at 25 cents at a time. So you could accumulate these stamps uh, and buy bonds. Um, there were several different issues of the bonds. So there was the Liberty bonds, the Victory bonds. Um, and so there's several different campaigns. This is the war saving stamps. A lot of these are pitched towards women because the women were, in many cases, the, the ones who took care of the family finances. So if you wanted to have the school kids taking in a quarter a week to get, to get war saving stamps, that was a decision mostly that mom was going to make. And so they're going to pitch this towards women. Um, there's also, what's really interesting, if you look at these in the light of what we talked about on Tuesday in terms of immigration, um, the, the, so this is, that's Statue of Liberty. Um, I always thought she was really cute. I don't know about the GI Wish I were a man thing, but, but I always thought she was cute. Um, so if I were a man, I would join the Navy to be a man. But see this? So your first, your, remember your first role of American liberty, and there's the Statue of Liberty. Your duty is to buy United States government bonds. So there's a lot of these are appealing to women. There's another whole step they're appealing to immigrants. I love this, that honor roll. The names, those are names of Americans, and notice the ethnic diversity in those names. Um, yeah. Uh, and good old Boy Scouts, right? So the Boy Scouts are still there. All right. So that, that's, this is cycled through several times now, so I have to figure out how to get out of this. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. Did I plug in my clicker? What did I do with my clicker? Here it is. Okay. Um, let's see, I sent you an email this morning. Your next response paper is due next Friday. It is not on the article we're discussing today. It's on the other article by me that's in the reader. So the article today, your word is not enough, is not the one you're writing the response paper on. You're writing a response paper on avoiding default. How many people have taken 134 with the roamers? So you already read it once, right? So you're reading it a second time. Um, I didn't know that when I put the syllabus together. Um, but that's the article that you're writing the response paper on, the avoiding default article. Okay, any questions before I get fully started? Really, really started? Okay, cool. All right. So I showed you all that stuff at the end of the day on Tuesday and read to you from those articles I sent you the links to about race relations uh, circa 1920 United States, just to give you the sense of this was not a good time to be a black person in America, uh, that there was an awful lot of discrimination going on um, and, and violence as well. So in that context, in this article, uh, the author, me, um, looks, at, <laughs> looks at the differences by race in the use of credit. Um, this is actually, I'll give you some backstory on this. I did my graduate work on uh, the consumer durables revolution, which I'll talk about later on, so the increase in the purchases of durable goods in the 1920s. And, um, this is how research happens, is that then I was presenting a paper at a conference when I was, I think, finishing up my graduate work, and Claudia Golden, who's the person who wrote the articles we read on education, and she's done a lot of work on slavery and a lot of work on women, was at the conference, and she said, in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., when I was in the back room, which you're not allowed to go in, when I was in the back room where all the things are, I saw all these file folders, and there's some consumer spending survey in there, and I think it might have data in it that you want. So I contacted, that's how things happen, right? So you see some, you talk to somebody, and this is why conferences, this is why Melissa Meyer says, come to work, don't work at home, um, because these network externalities, right? You have this conversation with somebody over drinks at a conference, and all of a sudden you're off on a whole research project. Um, the, a lot of the data had already been coded by a group that's called the Interuniversity Consortium for Political and Social Research, ICPSR. If you do a thesis, it's a group you'll probably get to know. Um, and, but they had skipped over coding the information that had been filled in on uh, how, whether people had used debt, uh, what kind of savings they had done, what kind of bills they had paid off. And so I went back to the archives and got these pawed through these 13,000 different forms from 13,000 different families and worked at the archives for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, you know, you go down with your laptop at the time, the laptops were pretty big. It was uh, yo by yo by yo. Uh, so they called it a lunchbox. It was literally, it was like, you know, 18 by 12 by... 15. Uh, and I would go down to the archives. This is in Washington, D.C., down near the mall. You go down to the archives during the day, you check in, and you work from 9 to 5. You go back to the hotel room at night, you eat, uh, I would eat a salad that I got at the Safeway, and I go back to my hotel room, I sit on the bed, and clean up the data that I had coded that day. I go back in the morning, and I code for another eight hours, uh, and clean up the data. And so that's, that's the nitty gritty of how people do research that then winds up being analysis that you can do that then you write up and you walk it around and take, present it at conferences and at seminars like I was doing last week when I was out of town. Um, not this paper, new stuff. Uh, and then you submit it to a journal and they say, yeah, you know, change this, change this, change this, change this, change this. Have you really thought about that very hard? Uh, and then we'll publish it, and then it gets published, and then it gets in a reader, and students read it. Um, so that's the process. But a lot of things like this happened very serendipitously, uh, where it just happens that Claudia was trying to get some data. She knew it was in the back. The person who worked at the archives couldn't find the surveys that she wanted that she knew were there. So the person said, come on in the back with me and let's see if we can find them together. And so while she was sort of pawing around looking for her stuff that led to the work she did on marriage bars, um, she happened to see this other thing which she put into her memory bank and then remembered it when she was talking to me and knew that I was interested in consumer spending. So that's how it works. All right. So what this article does is it looks at the use of credit by families. And one of, it makes two distinctions that aren't usually made in the literature. One is the difference by race, and the other is the difference by type of credit. So there's two different types of credit. One is installment credit. And installment credit is when you go down and you're buying a particular durable good, a car, an appliance, like a washer, uh, a piece of furniture, a piano, a phonograph, something along those lines. And you make arrangements to pay for that over time. Now, you may think of that as I have a car loan, right? So if you go down to the dealer today and you buy a car and you sign papers to pay for that over five years, you may say, yeah, I got a car loan when I went down to the Toyota dealership. 
It's not technically a loan. So the lawyers will tell you it's not a loan of money. It's a contract to buy a good over time. This distinction doesn't matter to you and me, but it matters a lot to the lawyers. Because there's different laws that apply to loans of money than apply to contracts to pay over time. So an installment contract is tied to a particular good. It's so that you can pay over time for that good. So you don't have to pay for the whole thing up front. Uh, and there are consequences if you don't pay. So if you don't pay, the consequence with an installment contract is the good that you're purchasing can be repossessed. So you go down to the Toyota dealership, sign one of those contracts to buy a Toyota. You miss a few payments when you come out in the morning and your car is gone and you call Berkeley PD and say somebody stole my car. They're going to go on their computer and they're going to say, no, they repossessed it last night. Did you not make your payments the last couple months? So if you miss payments on one of these installment plans, they'll come and they'll repossess your car or your, your washing machine or your piano or your phonograph or whatever it is. The other kind of credit is what I call merchant or in-store credit. So this is credit that's extended directly by a merchant, a grocer, the funeral parlor, the doctor, the dry goods store, uh, the clothier. Uh, extended directly by this individual to a family, and typically this is credit, and not that. How do I want to say this? This credit is not tied to a particular good. So you go down to the grocery store and you, to the grocer, and you get five pounds of sugar and three pounds of lard and ten pounds of flour and a few other things, and then you sign the book that you will pay at the end of the month. So it's not that this is credit to pay over time for the flour and the other things. It's just you had a total bill at the grocer and you're going to pay it later on. So that's what I call in-store or merchant credit. The difference, the big difference between the installment credit and the merchant credit is the merchant credit is used to purchase services, things like funerals, and non-durable goods, things like food. And so if you don't pay back the merchant for that in-store credit, there's nothing for the merchant to repossess. You've already eaten the bread that you made with the flour. You've already buried dad or grandpa or whoever it was that you had to bury. Uh, you've already gone to the doctor and gotten the pills and taken the pills and hopefully gotten better. So there's nothing left to repossess. The, the, the ability to repossess a good in the case of installment credit, that good is the collateral on the loan. It's, it's what you offer as collateral as uh, what you're putting up against this extension of credit from the, the seller. With merchant credit, the only thing you have to offer is your collateral is your word that you will repay, your promise that you'll repay. And that, that's the title of the article. Yeah. Typically settled. Some, was it settled on a monthly basis? There's, in the survey, there's no evidence of how often it's settled. Um, Sometimes there's bills that, that sort of roll over. Uh, with the doctor, it may, probably is not settled on a monthly basis. You probably make a payment on a monthly basis, uh, but you don't pay off the whole bill once a month. Same with the funeral parlor. Okay. The installment credit from the survey, the survey was a survey, it was a consumer purchase survey that was taken in 1918 and 1919. Oh, I meant to bring something in. I'll try to remember next week. Um, and it's about an 11 or 13 page, I forget, survey in which they would ask it down with families and ask them a series of questions basically about how did you spend your money over the last 12 months. And it's very detailed. So how many pounds of rutabagas did you buy in the last 12 months and how much did they cost per pound? How many pounds of potatoes did you buy? How many pounds of flour did you buy? How many undershirts for your first son? How many undershirts for your second son? How many undershirts for your third son? And so on. So incredible levels of detail of data. What I meant to bring in, and I hope I remember to bring it next week, is it wasn't uncommon common for families to keep logs of how they spent their money. So I have a log my mother kept, uh, 1937, 1938, which is in fact, interestingly enough, in a, in a family accounts book that was published by Jessica Pajoto, who was the first woman economist uh, here at Berkeley. So she was a tenured faculty member of the economics department 100 years ago, um, for whom the Pajoto room, the Pajoto room in our department is named. Uh, and she studied family budgets and family spending, and she, she uh, put together this book for people to use to write down what it is they spent their money on. So that there would be agents that were all women, and they would go and they would interview people, and they would get their answers to these questions. Uh, the interviews were done between 1918 and 1919. Every survey covers a year worth of data. This data set has actually been used as well to study the influenza of 1918 because of different. Um, uh, not everybody reported in the same month, and so you can watch the progress of the flu through the population. It's very cool. Um, uh, and there was a point I was going to make, and I forget what it was. Um, it'll come back to me. Okay, so, so what do we get from this? The pianos that were purchased, 80% of the white families, 95% of the black families purchased them on credit. The others used cash. Phonographs, 50% of the white and black families used credit. Furniture, 20% of the white and 50% of the black families used credit. Appliances, 15% of the white and 25% of the black families used credit. So the installment credit is getting used mostly for these types of goods. Notice cars are not up here. This is 1918, 1919. It's really before the boom in cars. So the real boom in automobile sales comes in the 1920s. That's going to be relevant when we talk about the Great Depression. But this period is before the boom in, in auto sales. So what do we know? Looking at the data set, what we see, and this is up here at table two, these, the first tables, by the way, are from, last, from Tuesday's handout. So, so the big, thick handout that you got for today starts with the next set of material for this part on my work, if you want that little two-page handout that you picked up on Tuesday. Uh, so installment credit, oh, 14 cities. The black families in this, in this survey are all, basically, except for like three of them, all live in 14 cities. And so even though the survey itself includes 99 cities, for a lot of these data, what I report up here are all the white families and then the white families in those 14 cities, in case there was an effect of just being in those cities, versus the black families in those 14 cities. So if I look just at the 14 cities, white versus black, um, what, what struck me, my priors, okay, my priors going in before I started playing with the data was I expected to see that the white families were using credit much more often than the black families because I knew that the white families had uh, higher income and higher wealth uh, as well as the, the priors I had based on race. So I was really surprised by this bottom line. No, I was really surprised by the top line. Right? I was really surprised, surprised by everything. I was very surprised by the top line uh, that showed that the black families were using installment credit much more often than the white families were. Uh, that the 37% of the black families were using installment credit versus only 23% of the white families. So that initial summary statistic really sort of surprised me. And then there's a difference in the pattern between installment and merchant credit. So with the merchant credit, 24% of the white families and 22% of the black families. About the same percentage of families are using the white are using the merchant credit. Table three that's reprinted here gives you some summary statistics about the data themselves. Uh, shows that the income of the black families is less than the income of the white families. Uh, more often, the white is in the paid labor force for the black families, and it's true for the white families. Forty. Uh, if you look at paid labor force, that includes people who have job, you know, jobs outside of the home. Income from any source includes as well if you uh, if a family takes in borders or takes in laundry or uh, takes yeah, domestic work. So so uh, a border. Uh, you have a house and you let people live in your house and you house them and you feed them. So that's a border. There's borders and lodgers. Lodgers, you rent a room. Nobody gives you any food. Borders, you rent a room and they provide you with food. So my grand, my nana, my dad's mother, they always had borders in the house. There were always men that lived in the house and she provided their food and they paid rent for the food in the in the room. So that this line percentage of the wife percentage of who have income from any source includes the boarding income uh, as well as working outside the home. In the black families, 50% of the uh, wives worked outside the home. In the white families, only 10% worked outside the home. So big difference. This is going to come back when we talk about women's labor force participation and the rise in women's labor force participation. When, when we talk in a few weeks, we're going to talk about the post-war rise in women's labor force particip
And then I let the wealth variable vary depending upon how big the house was. So if you owned a 14 room house, you had more wealth than if you owned a four room house. Um, and so that was the measure of wealth. So the size of houses doesn't vary very much by race, but the propensity to own a house certainly does. All right. So oh, this just says the same thing. Uh, installment credit, greater use by black families than white families, different pattern for the merchant in store credit. So this is what we see with the summary statistics, but in order to tease out how much of this difference is explained by income and wealth, we need econometrics. So you need to use econometric analysis in order to figure out what, it, once we account for differences in income and wealth, because clearly there's lower income and lower wealth on the part of the black families and on the part of the white families, do we still come to the same conclusions that are up here on the board? That the black families are using installment credit more often than the white families, and that the white families are using merchant credit more often than the black families. In this case, the analysis that we're doing is a little bit different. So every other article we've done has had a continuous variable to the left-hand side. This is the first one like this, right? That's right. Okay, that's right. So the, the ownership variable that Richard Such had in his article and, and this variable in my article are, in both cases, the, the variable you're trying to explain, the left-hand side or dependent variable in both of these things, is a zero-one. It's what we call a dummy variable or an indicator variable. Uh, in my case, it's did they use installment credit or did they not use installment credit? In such a case, it was do they own a house, do they not own a house? And so the answer to those questions is either yes or no. And so the type of analysis that you do when you're trying to tease out the expl explanation for differences when the answers are only yes or no, as opposed to I am 60, I don't know how tall I am, 68.3 inches tall versus 67.8 inches tall versus 69.4 inches tall. But there's a lot of variation. When you have only yes or no as your possible answers, it, it uses a slightly different technique. It means you can't do it with Excel. Um, it means that when you're using Stata, which is the program that, that a lot of us use, and if you, take, if you do a thesis, it's the program that you'll buy to use for your thesis, instead of typing the word regress, you type either logit or probit. I mean, it's, as far as what you're concerned when you're a user of these things, you really don't notice the difference. Um, so the, you cannot interpret the size of the coefficients in a logit analysis as having any meaning. So we can get some meaning out of the size of the coefficients and everything else, but we can't for what we're doing here. For what we're doing here, all that you can get out of it is, is it positive or negative, and is it statistically significant? That's all we can tease out. Um, so that's what this says. All right. So what are the results? In the paper, you can see that there's this is a, re a regression that has a ton of variables in it. I'm not going to show you a table that has 64 different variables in it. I'm just going to show you the key result, which is the top line in the table, uh, and which is repeated here, which shows you the coefficient on the variable white. So this is saying controlling for everything else. So controlling for income, controlling for wealth, controlling for how old the wife is, controlling for how big the family is, controlling for what occupation the husband's in, controlling for what region the family lives in, controlling for, I forget what else is controlled for in that equation, in that uh, analysis that's in the paper you can see there. What's left over for the race variable to explain? What's left over for the race variable to explain is captured with this coefficient here. And what it says is, first for the installment credit, and these are T stats in parentheses, it says in the heading. For installment credit, notice it's now a negative coefficient, and it's statistically significant. That says that controlling for income and wealth and family size and age and all those other variables, the white families are actually using installment credit less often than the black families. The summary statistic had the opposite. The summary statistic had that 37% of the black families and 20 some odd percent of the white families were using installment credit. The reason those numbers in the summary stats are so different is because the income and the wealth are much lower for the black families than they are for the white families. And in fact, once you control for income and wealth, the white families are using installment credit less often. And it's a statistically significant effect. What's interesting then is to look at the contrast with merchant credit. With merchant credit, once you control for income and wealth and age of the wife and family size and all these other things that are in regression, what do you get? This coefficient on whether or not the family is white has a positive, is a positive coefficient, again, statistically significant, which means that the white families are using the merchant credit more often than the black families are. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're right. Thank you. My brain was just going upside down. Right. So the coefficient, you're right. Thank you. So the negative coefficient in the first column is consistent with the summary stats. Sorry about that. All right. So yes. It's been a long day. Um, the summary stats say that the black families are using, yeah, we've seen my more or less than black all flipped around. All right, so yes. So once we control for income and wealth, it still is the case that the white families are using installment credit less often than the black families, which is consistent with the summary stats, thank you. And that the, the white families are using merchant credit more often than the black families. And again, it's a statistically significant result. So the interesting thing in here, what we're really picking up is the difference in sign. That controlling for income and wealth, the, the white families are less likely than the black families to use installment credit, but more likely than the white families are more likely than the black families to use merchant credit. There's a, that's different, right? These things are not the same. Something's going on there. The argument, oh wait, not the argument yet. Um, one way, well, let me back up. In the analysis, the only place where race enters in is with this dummy variable or indicated variable for race, the are you white or not. So it takes on the one of the family is white and the zero otherwise. Now, what that means, anytime you see when there's just a dummy variable or indicate, we used to call them dummies and then I, I don't know, people didn't like to be called dumb or something. So we now call them indicator variables. I still think of them as dummies. It's the same thing. When you stick a dummy variable into a regression, essentially what you're saying is, I think that the, the I'm going to do this both graphically and in words. I think the slopes are the same for both the white and the black families, but I think there's a shift in the intercept, right? So another way of saying that is I think the reaction of, in this case, the likelihood of using credit to a change, a dollar change in income is the same for both white and black families. I think there's just a level shift in the overall likelihood. So when you have a dummy, all, when all you have to, to account for the difference by race is that dummy variable. You're saying that there's no difference in how the white and black families respond to a change in income. There's no difference in how the white and black families respond to a change in wealth. There's no difference in how they respond to a change in family size. That all the difference by race is, is due to something other than the various variables that we've already talked about. The wealth, the income, the white stage, the family size, and so on. Well, that might not be right. It might be instead, it might be that the reaction to, think elasticity, that the reaction to a change in income might differ between black and white families. Or the reaction to a change in wealth might differ between black and white families. And statistically, you're not going to pick that up when you just have a dummy variable. Because the dummy variable is, is saying these slopes are the same. There's just a shift between the white and the black families. And there's not differences in slopes. So one way to account for the possibility that there's different reactions to income, to wealth, to age, and so on, one possibility is to do what they call interaction terms, where you say, well, let me stick black income in here and white income in here and let those things vary. Let me stick black age in here and white age in here and let those things vary. Another possibility, and in some things that we'll look at, we'll see that. That's not what I did. What, another way of doing it is to say, let's take and estimate the relationship twice. Estimate it one time.